Well, welcome again, everybody, to the soapbox for Easter Sunday. Today, we will be discussing the subject of the resurrection. After all, it is today, at this time of year, more than 2,000 years ago, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So, John, how important is the resurrection to Christianity? Yeah, it's a great question. And at the end of the day, if there's no resurrection, we may as well not be Christians. And I'm just going to share a couple of scriptures with you. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 through to 19 says, If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they who are fallen asleep, in other words, those who have died, they are perished. If in this life only, we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable, it says there. And going to verse 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And, you know, that theme of Jesus being the first fruits, if any of you have ever had a, a fruit tree, you'll know the fruit will ripen at different times. And you'll maybe pick your first ripe apple and that'll be great. But you don't pick them all because the others aren't quite ripe yet. But you're not going to pick bananas off your apple tree, right? Mm. You're going to pick more apples. And so just as Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead bodily and physically, so it is going to be with us. And this is the, this is the, the sad thing about a, a lot of the, the hope that a lot of Christians have. They think. When you die, you leave your body behind. You don't need your body. And somehow this immortal soul inside you floats off to heaven. Well, did that happen with Jesus? No. The very fact the tomb was empty and his body was gone means that eternal life revolves around needing a physical body. And if he is the first fruit, the first ripe apple, then all of us are also going to be apples. We're also going to receive our eternal life with a physical body, right? And of course, that will happen um, at Christ's return. Now, Acts 10, uh, and this is Peter um, speaking at the time when Cornelius, the, the first Gentile, probably not the first because there were Gentiles during Jesus' ministry, but the, the first call really that went to the Gentiles officially. In Acts 10, 39, he says there, we are witnesses of all things which he did, which Jesus did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses, chosen before God, even to us. And we ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, Peter here is telling Cornelius, we were witnesses. We saw the risen Christ. And the disciples weren't the only ones. When Jesus rose from the dead, it says there were over 500 witnesses. And we've got those accounts, those witnesses, recording what they saw in the Gospels. And people might say, well, how can you prove Jesus rose from the dead? We've got eyewitness accounts. And just in the case of, of a court of law, it's up to the skeptics to prove that the Bible, these Gospel records, are liars. We have a Gospel record, and we've got documents here that go back to the first century they found the gospels dating right back to the first century so we've got old documents it's up to the skeptics if they don't believe in the resurrection to prove that these guys were telling lies and it's it's actually inconsistent to say they were telling lies because the the key fundamental precept of christianity is truth jesus says i am the way the truth and the life what did they have to gain by telling lies? Because these guys ended up becoming martyrs, suffering and dying for this risen Christ they believed in. So there was really nothing to be gained, you know, by telling lies. Hebrews 10 verse 12 says, but this man, this is talking about Jesus, of course, after he had offered one sacrifice 
for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. That's those of us who believe. Now, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we don't have a high priest. We don't have someone in heaven seated on the right hand of God that can bear us. And, and this is the wonderful thing about Christ. You know, anyone who comes to Christ, and I say anyone, if you've been abused as a child, if you've been abused as an adult, if, if no one's liked you, if you've been hated through your life, if you've struggled with self-esteem, if you've tried to commit suicide, you know, if you've been bankrupt, if you've had broken marriage, whatever, no one can say, Jesus won't understand me. Because Jesus was tempted in all points that we are. He was regarded his whole life as being illegitimate. You know, he had a miraculous birth. His father was, was God. Um, Mary got pregnant by the power of God. And, and of course, that caused the scandal that, well, Mary's pregnant. Who's the father? So Jesus, his whole life, put up with these negative issues throughout his life. He knows what it feels like to be unfairly treated. The Pharisees were envious of him, so they crucified him. You know, so I'd encourage anybody who might be listening to this, if, if you haven't come to Christ, you have someone at the right hand of God, the creator of the universe, who loves you and can bear with you and can actually impact upon your life. So if Christ never rose from the dead, we have no conqueror of sin and death, which is fundamental if we want to live forever, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We die because of sin. So we need someone to conquer sin. That's what Christ did. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we have no mediator. There's no one to bear with us and to understand what we've gone through. And as we've just read through, through in Hebrews there, we have no judge for the future who's going to say to us, even though we die, rise again and come and be with me forever because I've forgiven your sins. So that's how, that's how important the risen Christ is to our Christian faith. Now, we, of course, are commemorating um, the time, the specific time of the year when Jesus Christ was crucified and then rose from the dead. And this was the reason, because he rose on the first day of the week, that's what we call Sunday. This is the reason that the first century church started meeting on a Sunday. Now, there are Christians today who believe we still have to keep the Sabbath. Um, well, that's not when the Christians kept it, the, the Jewish Sabbath. They actually met together on the first day of the week. Now, having said that, it doesn't matter. Romans 14 says, listen, don't judge anyone for whatever day. If someone wants to regard one day wholly above another, that's fine to God. But we mustn't judge others by saying, oh, you must meet on a Saturday or, or you must meet on a Sunday. But that's when the, the first century disciples did it. And that's, that's when we do it. And there's evidence of this, of course, in, in the word of God. Acts 20 verse 7 says, upon the first day of the week, that's what we call Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. And in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2, Paul writes to the Corinthians there, he says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay aside the store, the money, the funds that God has prospered you with, and this was going to be given as an offering. So again, this is when they would come together the first day of the week to break bread and to have an offering for the churches. Right. So um, can you fill us in on the time of year and how like the Jewish calendar is connected to the Christian Easter today? Yeah. Now this is important because you know sometimes we Gentile Christians think, you know. We've got this new covenant in Christ and the Jews blew it. You know, they crucified Christ. God's rejected the Jews. Well, you've only got to read through Romans 11 to see that that's not true. The reality is we as Gentiles have been grafted in. And again, if you know anything about fruit trees, uh, I know your husband does, yeah. um, you sometimes get branches and you will add it to that tree. You make a cut and you graft it in and it then 
gets the sap from that tree and the, and the branch grows and you end up with a different variety of apple or, or whatever it is. So Romans 11 says we have been grafted in to the Jewish olive tree. You see, the promises given to Abraham, the Jewish faith originally, is the same faith that we have today. They're the same promises. It's just that we as Gentiles have been given the opportunity to join because basically the Jews rejected it. And the Passover was a once in a year time when the Jews would remember their deliverance from Egypt and they would kill they would kill a lamb without blemish and as a family they would all meet together eat the lamb and they would remember by the shedding of the blood of the lamb that God covered them remember if you know the story in Exodus they put blood above their door and the destroying angel whenever it saw the blood above the door it passed over that door it didn't go in and destroy the firstborn and that's why it's called the Passover, because the judgment passed over them. And so the Jews, every year to this day, the Jews keep the Passover. They eat the lamb and they remember that deliverance. Now, interestingly, Jesus Christ died at exactly this time of year at the, at the Jewish Passover. And basically, it was on the 14th day of the first month. And bear in mind, the Jews kept their program through the lunar calendar. So each month, each you know revolution of the moon, that was a new month for them. So on the 14th day was the day they were to keep the Passover. And as it turns out, um, this last Friday, a couple of days ago, was the Jewish Passover. And at this time... Of, of the month, they would, like I say, keep the Passover to, to celebrate being delivered from Egypt. And then it would follow with a seven day feast, the first day and the seventh day of that feast being special Sabbaths. Okay, normally that had, had a Sabbath from a Friday evening to a Saturday evening, but after the Passover, they had a special Sabbath. And I want you to just keep that in mind as well. Now, we call this time of year Easter. Uh, we generally don't refer to it as Passover. We call it Easter. And I just want to sort of touch on why we call it Easter. It is common for a lot of people to try and point out that Easter is actually based on a pagan fertility goddess, the Ostre. And they say that's where we get this Easter. So, you know, your, your Christian Easter is basically based on a pagan goddess. And they try and you know, bag Christianity as a result. Well, if you do a bit of research into it, it's actually more, uh, more widespread in the consensus of it that the word Easter actually derives from a Christian designation of a Latin phrase, um, in elbus, which basically means dawn. And Jesus actually is referred to as the morning star or the dawn star. You know, he's the bright morning star in Revelation 22. So the fact that Jesus rose from the dead on this dawn, on this first day of the week, um, that is, is where we get this term Easter from. And it became Eosterum in Old High German, and that became the precursor of our English word Easter. And um, you can actually read that in Encyclopedia Brit Britannica. I didn't make all that up, but uh, that seems to be the origin of, of the word Easter. In Acts 12, verse 4, we actually read Easter in the authorized version when it says that when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four um, quartonians of soldiers to keep him. This is talking about Paul, obviously, intending after Easter. But if you look at the original Greek word, it's Pascha, which, which means Passover. Um, You've probably heard the phrase Paschal Lamb or Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb. So it's been given Easter in our English, but it's the Greek Pascha from the, the Jewish Passover. Um, and interestingly, um, the, the reason that Jesus died and rose again at, at the Passover, it was all a type. Because just as the Jews slew a lamb, you know, as a, as a remembrance of their deliverance, so Jesus Christ was slain. 
he shed his blood once and for all for the sins in the world. And you know what's interesting in the word of God? He's actually referred to as our Passover. So you see the Jewish Passover was all a type. Um, and that word type just means a foreshadow or a figure pointing forward to Christ. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, it says, purge out the old leaven. And it's speaking symbolically. You know, leaven is like yeast. It, it, it puffs up the bread. And Paul is writing saying, listen, don't be puffed up. Don't have pride. Purge that out. And he says, purge out the old leaven and be a new lump. You know, that word new in scripture. You know, when you become a Christian, you become a new creation, a newborn babe. So there's very much a, a theme with Christians, just like Jesus Christ rose from the dead as a new being, as an immortal being. So we become new creatures. So it says, purge out the old leaven, be a new lump as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So you can see the connection there as to why Jesus was crucified at the Passover, because God was using that to point forward to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, you may have wondered when you've read Matthew 12, verse 40, you may not have wondered, but you may have. And it says there, and this was Jesus speaking at the time. He says, just as Jonah, remember Jonah, the guy who got swallowed by the big fish or the whale, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the belly of the huge fish, so the son of man, Jesus, shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, very specific, isn't it? Just as Jonah was three days, three nights, so Jesus will be three days, three nights. Now, I want you to think about this, because the traditional view is that Jesus Christ was crucified on a Friday. We call it Good Friday, although it was a bad Friday at the time anyway. We call it Good Friday. And then he rose on Sunday. Okay, do the maths. Yeah. He's in the tomb Friday night, Saturday night, two. You can stretch it to three days if you say, well, there's a portion of Friday, all day Saturday, and maybe there was a little time in the morning Sunday before he rose. You could stretch that to three days. But there's no way you can get three nights out of that, is there? There's only two nights. So... How is this possible that Jesus said, and remember, you know, the Bible makes it clear, not one jot or tittle shall pass away from my word. And, and the jots and the tittles, if you've ever looked at the Hebrew words, they are those little wee nicks that form part of the letters. They're little wee things, jots and tittles. Not one part will fail from God's word. It is true, 100%. So how are we going to work out how we get three nights? Well, it's very simple when, when you know how. Because the assumption is, because we're Gentiles, if, if, if it was the Sabbath, and we know it was, because that's why um, they, the soldiers came to break the legs of those who were crucified with Jesus, because the Sabbath was drawing near, and, and the Jews didn't want them left on the cross for the Sabbath. So they came to Jesus. He was already dead. He didn't have his legs broken. But as Gentiles, we assume this was the normal Friday night Sabbath, right? Going into the Saturday. But as I said to you earlier, when they had the Passover, when they had the Passover in the evening, the next day, no matter what day of the week it was, because remember, it's, it's, it's all around the lunar, the lunar cycle. Doesn't matter what day it was, it was a Sabbath. Now, if Jesus died on a Thursday night, so bear with me, still got your attention, hopefully. No glazed looks yet. If Jesus died on a Thursday night, if, if the Passover was on a Thursday, then he's in the tomb Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. There's your three nights. And it means that the Thursday evening to the Friday evening, that, remember, becomes a special Sabbath because it's following the Passover. And then... You go straight into the normal weekly Sabbath from the Friday evening 
to the Saturday evening. And that explains why the women only went to the tomb on the Sunday morning. Because you think about it, why didn't they go on the Saturday when the Sabbath, you know, finished? But, but no, they had to wait two Sabbaths. There was the Passover Sabbath, the normal weekly Sabbath, before they could actually allowed to travel and, and go, to the, go to the tomb. So the word of God, it's amazing. These details, three days and three nights, that's the explanation for that. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it, John? Just to have a point around mm. the Bible that just pointed forth and just shows how important the resurrection mm. was. That will point it forward Absolutely. to Christ and what he achieved. Mm. Um, so, John, how problematic is the story of a Jew 2,000 years ago rising from the dead to scientific and logical examination? Well, it's no problem, really, if you believe. But, you know, I've been an unbeliever. I know what it's like to be a, a skeptic. And I think one of the main stumbling blocks is that resurrection isn't just your normal run of the mill garden gnome sort of happening, is it? I mean, you don't see people rise from the dead every day of the week, do you? It's a miracle, right? And the problem is, especially in our enlightened age where we've got all the technology, we don't believe in miracles. Miracles don't exist, do they? Because unless you can explain it, it's, it's a miracle, all right? So Jesus couldn't have risen from the dead because it's a miracle. Well, let's just have a think about what a miracle is. Um, you can define it slightly different ways, but generally speaking, we would define a miracle as an extraordinary event that is inexplicable or unexplainable by natural or scientific laws, right? I think that's that's a pretty good, pretty good explanation. And something that's scientific describes something that you can observe and measure. And you can't observe or measure miracles. Okay, so let's have a let's have a think about that. So if miracles are inexplicable and they're not scientific, does that mean they don't happen? Well, I would argue, actually, we're surrounded by miracles. I mean, if man is so smart, birth a baby in a test tube, grow a piece of grass. Yeah, we, we look at these things. We take childbirth, the grass growing, or we take them for granted because we see them every day. But they are miracles. You know, I used to be an evolutionist. Sorry to say that, but embarrassed to admit it. <laughs> But the reality is, you know what? The evolutionist expects us to believe there was this big ball of gas a few billion years ago, and it just inexplicably exploded. And over a period of time, hey presto, you've got planets, you've got life, you know, not only life, but you've got the simplest form of, of life, like a little amoeba, mm. through to a chimpanzee, through to a lion, through to a giraffe, through to human beings. And that just all happened by a big explosion. Now, seriously, is that scientific? To me, that's a bigger miracle than Jesus rising from the dead. So I don't think the skeptics have, have really got a leg to stand on by saying, oh, he couldn't have risen from the dead because it's a miracle and miracles don't happen. Because mm -hmm. in evolution, that's got to be the biggest miracle you could ever experience. And where, where can you observe an explosion creating order. I defy you, take as long as you like to show me any explosion producing order. It just does, does not happen. I had a, um, a skeptic say to me once, he says, I don't believe in the resurrection, but I'll tell you what he said to me. If you let yourself be run over by a steamroller and then come back to life, then I'll believe in the resurrection. Well, I said to him, I can show you better than that. I can show you better than that. Because do you think the resurrection of millions of people would be a bigger event than the resurrection of one? I think so. Eh? You know, if I could show you the resurrection of millions of people versus just one, well, that's, that's a bigger deal, surely. Yeah. 
well, take a look at Israel. Take a look at Israel. The Jews, the Jews are God's witnesses. Isaiah 43, verse 10, God says, you are my witnesses. Now, the Jews disobeyed God. They ended up being scattered amongst the nations as a result. But God said, because of my name and because I want to be glorified, you know what? I'm going to gather you again. I will scatter you amongst the nations. But he said in Jer Jeremiah 46, verse 28, I will not allow a full end of you, but I will regather you, bring you back to your land, and you will prosper. Now, in 1948, after almost 2,000 years of being dead, non-existent, Israel was back on the map. That is a national resurrection. That is a resurrection of millions of people. And, you know, it's presented in exactly that way in the book of Ezekiel. Quite amazing. Ezekiel 37, you'll probably remember it. Ezekiel sees a vision of a whole lot of dry bones. And he says to the Lord, what is this? And the Lord says, this is Israel. They're dead. And then Ezekiel saw these bones rattling together. And the sinews came on them. And then they stood up a great army. And it was, it was a parable, it was a, an, an enactment of the nation of Israel being dead and coming back to life again. Now, there is not one other nation in the whole of history that that has happened to. And, and bear in mind, there were mighty empires much bigger than Israel. The Hittites, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Jebusites, you know, there were dozens of them. They all came to destroy Israel. Who today can say, I'm a Jebusite, I'm a Hittite. They don't exist. But at least six, seven, eight million people today, and that's just in Israel, can say, I'm an Israelite, I'm a Jew. And it's a, it's a miracle because 2,000 years ago, God predicted this. And, and I would say that's a national resurrection. If, if you want evidence for the miracle of the resurrection, look to Israel because God did it in a national way. And if he can raise a whole nation back to life after 2000 years, <laughs> he can raise one man after three days. Yeah, so cool. Um, so John, there's always gonna be skeptics though, isn't there? <laughs> and a number of objections have been raised by skeptics to propose the resurrection story such as you know, like the disciples stole the body, Jesus didn't really die, um, but he was revived in the tomb, etc. You know, how would you answer those? Yeah, if you look at all of those objections, none of them are tenable. They really are desperate attempts to try and undermine the resurrection. And as you mentioned, you know, there's the view that, well, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He wasn't quite dead. And after they took him down, he revived. And he came back to life. And you're telling me he was able to convince all his disciples, not to mention 500 witnesses, that he was now an immortal being. Seriously, we need to have seen a crucifixion, I think, to realize how impossible that is. He had a spear put through his side. He had nails through his hands. He'd been beaten, flogged, left there, you know, for hours on him. There's no way. He's going to revive in the tomb and be able to convince people he's risen from the dead. Another common one is the disciples came and they stole the body. You know, they snuck into the tomb, they stole the body, and therefore there was an empty tomb and said that Jesus has risen from the dead. Well, again, it, it, it's untenable, firstly, because their Christianity that, that Jesus had taught them was based on truth, based on honesty, not, not deception. So it cuts right against the message of Jesus. Secondly, these guys, as I mentioned earlier, these disciples went on, and remember they ran away. They ran away in fear when, when Jesus got arrested. Now, not many days afterwards, they went through Israel and then the known world being beaten, being ridiculed, um, most being martyred, because they were preaching a Christ that they knew they'd stolen his body? Seriously? I mean, that's, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? 
would you go and martyr yourself knowing, well, actually, I'm telling a whole lot of porkies here and Jesus really isn't risen. Why throw my life? It, it's just all untenable, the, these excuses that they, that they come up with. And, you know, the other important thing about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ is this was prophesied. Um, we've got a, a booklet that you can get on our website, BibleTruthRestored.org. That's Bible Truth Restored, all one word. Um, if you forget that, just contact us. We can uh, get that to you. There's a PDF of a book talking all about the messianic prophecies given of Jesus. Because to be the Messiah, to be the promised Messiah, you had to meet dozens and dozens of requirements. You had to be of the son of uh, David. You had to be divinely begotten etc cetera, etc cetera. you had to preach this preach that you had to be born in bethlehem all these details the crucifixion was prophesied and when christ comes back it says the jews will look on him whom they pierced and they will mourn and god's grace will be upon them but they will mourn they will realize wow these holes in his hand we realize jesus is the messiah that we've rejected for so long and, and that's a prophecy in Zechariah of how Jesus would be pierced, which is, of course, crucifixion. So all of these prophecies also include his resurrection, because it was prophesied that the Lord would not let him perish in the grave. Psalm 16, verse 10, you will not leave my soul. Now, a soul isn't something inside you that floats away to heaven. No. Biblical definition of a soul is what you are. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. A soul is you with the dirt of your body, because we come from the dust of the ground, with your breath inside you. That's what a soul is. And that's why the Bible says the soul that sins shall die. When you die, your soul dies. It's not something that lives on. So, you know, please realize that. So when it says he will not leave my soul, it's basically saying he will not leave me or my body in hell. And again, there's some traditional misunderstandings of hell. Hell it just means the grave. Um, hell is our English word for the Hebrew sheol, which just means the grave. So it's saying you will not leave me in the grave or let me suffer corruption. And this is a thing. After three days, he didn't suffer corruption. His body hadn't start, started to rot away. So all of these prophecies of Christ coming, where he'd be born, what he would teach, how long he would live, because even the, the timing of when he would die is given in Daniel, that he would be crucified, but also that he would rise from the dead. So it's not just Jesus faking his resurrection. It's a matter of Jesus actually fulfilling dozens and dozens of prophecies. And this is the amazing thing about the Bible, the word of God. You don't have to just believe it at face value. It gives us evidence for why we can believe all of these prophecies. So yeah, feel free to ask for those um, booklets. There's also another booklet dealing with those um, skeptical things that people come up with, that the body was stolen, that it was the wrong tomb, all of that. Uh, we've got a booklet about that as well, if you want to read more. That, John. So, if the resurrection of Jesus really happened, um, what was it all about in the big picture of human history? Yeah, and that's that's really the the, the nitty gritty of it, isn't it? Mm. Because Jesus rising from the dead, well, that's great for him. He gets to live on, but that's that's not the end game. The end game is that sin can be vanquished. It's sin that separates us. From God. When God originally made man and woman, Adam and Eve, He said to them in Genesis 1, fill the earth, fill the earth, and have dominion over the fish of, fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the animals. God's plan initially was that for Adam and Eve, mankind would live forever on earth where He created them and have dominion. But he gave them a choice because if he hadn't given them a choice, they're robots, right? 
So God gave them a choice because God wants people to choose. He wants people to have an opportunity to choose to love him or not. He's not going to force you. He will tell you, I love you. I want you to be with me forever and I want to have a relationship with you. But it's a choice. It's a choice thing. So Adam and Eve chose to sin. <clears throat> You'll know the story. They chose the forbidden fruit. And as a result, as God had said, you shall become dying creatures. <clears throat> so you've got mankind then separated from God because God is a righteous God. God cannot have sin dwelling in his presence. So what happens now? Mankind now from Adam and Eve is in a sinful state. Well, you know, no one gets to march on God. No one beats God's plan. And God's plan has always been that mankind would be able to live with him forever. So what did he do? He sent his son. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. No man could conquer sin. We're all too weak. You know, it's not long. We're born and we sin because we're full of sinful flesh that's genetically in us. So he caused his power to overshadow a woman, Mary, basically what the male sperm would normally do in conception, God's power did. So Jesus was born human on his mother's side. He inherited human genetics, but on his father's side, he was spiritual. So he had that extra ability, that extra strength to overcome the flesh. But he was tempted in all points that we are. Hebrews tells us that. And he was able through a life of 100% obedience to die as the perfect, sinless son of God. Now, if the wages of sin is death, then the wages for sinlessness, it's life. And that's why Jesus was risen from the dead, because he'd never sinned. Death couldn't hold him. And so he's risen from the dead. Now, again, well, that's great for you, Jesus. That's great. You get to live. Well, what about the rest of us suckers? We can't overcome. Well, you know, that's where our God is just so amazing. Because he could say, well, Jesus, I'll just have a relationship with you. You're the only one who's done it. But you know what? He says, anyone who's prepared to believe in my son and accept him, as his savior and be baptized. Now, baptism involves a symbolic act of just going underwater and it represents you dying. It's basically saying, I want to die with Christ. But when I come out of the water, I'm a new, remember we talked about that, I'm a new creation. And, you know, it's so simple. So simple. We don't have to jump the highest height run the fastest distance, lift the heaviest weight, or be smart even? Anybody, anybody, if you're prepared to humbly believe Christ died and rose and he's your savior, we then qualify for this relationship with God. And when the time comes, when Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom where it originally was intended to be on earth, then we shall be raised and changed, it says. 1 Corinthians 15, in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall be given new bodies just like Jesus. Remember, we talked about it. The first fruits, we as fruit will follow. We're just waiting for that to happen. And, you know, it's so easy. We, we don't have to be smart. We don't have to be powerful. We just have to be faithful. And so God is just so amazing. He wants this relationship with us, and he's made the way available through Christ coming, dying, and rising from the dead to be now our mediator and we can pray to him he, he gets involved in our life and i've got to say you know as far as evidence for resurrection and we've talked about it from an objective perspective but you know there's no greater evidence for jesus being risen than having him work in your life and if you haven't had that experience, I want to quote this scripture to you. It's Psalm 34. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, you sometimes you go overseas, you find a fruit or a food you never tried before. You don't have a clue what it's like, do you? 
until you have a little taste and you discover some new wonderful flavors you've never experienced before. It's like that with Christ. If you've never had the risen Christ in, in your life, taste and see. Give him a try. I'll tell you what, he is not going to disappoint you. And I, I know Lenore, most of us here probably listening today, we've experienced that. I've experienced miracles in my life where I know Jesus Christ was batting for me and working for me. And, you know, yes, we can talk about the objective evidence. You know, Tacitus, who was a Roman orator and a senator, he talked about the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified by Pilate. So there's, there's evidence outside the Bible for historical Jesus, not to mention Josephus, the Jewish historian. But, you know, there's no, there's no greater evidence for the risen Christ than him working in your life. And, you know, when you get born again, when you accept Jesus Christ, you get a hope, peace, joy that you cannot have out of trying to pull yourself up by your bootlaces. It's supernatural. And you know, you talk about miracles. When, when someone gets born again and you see a change in their life, that's a miracle because people don't change. That's why we have sayings like a leopard can't change its spots because, you know, we try and change. We can't. We're locked into this flesh. So the resurrection, that's the big picture. It's not over yet. The big plan is not over. Jesus Christ has risen and he's now at the right hand of God, but only until the Bible says, until he comes and the earth is in subjection where there's going to be no more wars, no more famines, no more poverty, you know, and we look at the world's problems, right? And if they're economic, well, we've got heaps of economists. We've got billions of dollars floating around economies that could solve those problems. Why aren't they being solved? If it's just a social problem, we've got heaps of social workers and experts in sociology. Why haven't they solved the problem? Because it's not that. The problem in this world, it's a spiritual problem. It's sin. The pride and the greed of man is the problem. And it's not until Jesus Christ comes and rules this world as a righteous dictator, really, with a rod of iron, where no one will be able to get away with sin anymore, that we're going to have a decent world. And it's then, as Luke 1 says, that the son of the highest, and this was promised to Mary when she conceived, he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, which was in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign over that house. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Now, I've talked about some prophecies in scripture that have been fulfilled. This is one yet to be fulfilled. But, you know, if nine out of 10 Bible prophecies have already been fulfilled, hmm, pretty good odds, right? Pretty good odds. The last 10% is going to be fulfilled because God's word never fails. And in Revelation 2, just to finish off, it says there, verse 26, to he that overcomes, and this is talking to anybody who wants to take on Christ as your savior. You become an overcomer because you start overcoming your sinful nature through the blood of Christ. Anyone who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter Shall they be broken to shivers? All that unrighteousness and the bad stuff in the world, it'll be broken. Even as I received of my father, Jesus says. Just as Jesus has been given the right to reign, Jesus is saying to any who want to take him on into their life, you also shall be able to reign with me. So I hope you've enjoyed our discussion today. Just zeroing in on the resurrection of Christ. It's fundamental. It's key to the whole of God's plan and to our salvation. And if you believe in that, wow, it can revolutionize your life. So thank you um, for the fellowship we've enjoyed. Thank you, Lenore, for being the questioner today. And um, we'll finish the discussion there. But as we always do each week, but 
as we're perhaps poignantly going to do more now being this time of the year, we're going to break bread and uh, drink wine in remembrance of that sacrifice. And this is what the Bible tells us to do. This is what the first century Christians did just as a symbol um, to remind us of the sacrifice. So um, I don't know, um, Phil, if you would be happy to just give thanks before we partake of that, please. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you thankful for this opportunity of remembering the great love which you have for each one of us. We thank you for being refreshed in the knowledge of the work of your Son. And Heavenly Father, we'd ask that you'd help us to follow in his footsteps, that we may have our focus totally on doing your will, looking for the fulfillment of your promises. And we Thank you for this bread, which speaks to us of the body of Christ, which was freely given. We thank you for the emblem of the wine, which speaks to us of the new covenant, which you've called, um, called us to, which really, Heavenly Father, is the fulfillment of those promises that which you made to Abraham and to David and promised to Mary and to the disciples that we too through being united with Jesus Christ, also have a part in that glorious time when your son shall return. So, Heavenly Father, please bless us to that end and accept of our thanks for this wine and the bread for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> right, well, hopefully you're all prepared there and um, let's break bread together. <laughs>